uh, Wednesday, Jan. Oh, I do this all the time. Changing the date. It's Wednesday, June twentieth, twenty eighteen, and I'm in the home of Barbara Police, interviewing her for the Stonewall Oral History Project. Thank you, Barbara, for doing this with us. Oh, you're welcome. So, oral histories always start at the beginning. So, can you tell me where and when you were born, and something about how you grew up? Sure. Uh, I was born in Greenwich Village on Charles Street, uh, January 16, 1949. And uh, my mom was born in the village and all her family since 1779. So a true villager. And my dad was born on 27th and 10th. And he met my mom in the 30s and it's history. He went into the war and came out and then married my mom. And we've been in the village. We were in the village. I was in the village all my life, and uh, it, it, it it's a special place to grow up in. It was my Camelot, that's for sure. Can you tell me a little bit more about what your family was like and how you lived and what kind well, of? Well, my family, my my dad's family, uh, were pretty quiet. Um, a few of them were okay, rowdy a little bit. But my mom's family was a legend in the village. They were the Volpes and Delises, and uh, they had restaurants in the village, my grandma and my grandpa. And uh, that was in the 20s and 30s and 40s. And uh, my grandpa fed many people in his life in his restaurant, and a lot of them became stars later on. Uh, Ginger Rogers, Jimmy Durante, uh, Eddie Cantor, Humphrey Bogard, they were all starving people <laughs> at that particular time in history, and my grandpa fed them, and include an artist. And my mom wanted to become an artist, but he said no later on in life because all of them were broke. So what my grandma, my grandfather said, do something else. Don't be an artist, but she did. Uh, she became a statistician for. Marsha McLennan, and she did very well. My dad was with a company which is now L.L. Bean. So uh, they loved the village, and I loved the village. And growing up, well, being a kid in the village is like it was open. Uh, we had all sorts of different kinds of people, black, white, Chinese. Uh, mixed couples came down. They felt comfortable, so they were in the village. Uh, my mom and dad, well, they were on the socialistic side. And I learned how to live that way early on when I was six years old. My mom's best friend was a lesbian married to a Japanese man. You figure that one out. And uh, they used to play chess every Thursday, my mom and her. And uh, then we used to eat. This was 1959. And we were sitting on our fire escape with a hibachi, making shrimp and all sorts of stuff. And I was exposed to a lot of things during that particular time. I went to rallies with my mom and dad in Union Square. And I remember the day that I told them I was gay. I was about 12, 13 years old. And my mother looked at me and said, let's eat. And my father said, well, what happened to it? In other words, they didn't really care. It was not a big deal. And I learned that in my life, to just accept people the way they were. And my grandparents were the same way. Uh, on a Sunday afternoon, my grandpa and my mom used to cook. They had a big, they had two, sto two stoves in 24 Charles Street. And we'd have two gigantic tables with all sorts of different kinds of people. And I remember one thing, I was about six at the time, and a woman came in, a tall woman with the most gorgeous blue eyes, and she bent down and she said, and what's your name? And I said, Barbara. She said, mine's Betty. It was Lauren McCall. So I was exposed to that kind of thing all my life, and especially in the early years. My grandmother would play the piano and my mom would sing and the family would get together and all sorts of people, all characters, all there was, There was a woman that was a little tiny woman used to wear a weird looking hat. Her name was Anna Buck. Everybody knew her in the village. And that was the kind of background I had. It was just a joy to grow up in, in the village. And 
I, I, I was just saying to uh, Leela, is that I pity the ones, it sounds funny, the ones that came from the Midwest and everything, because I never had to go through what they went through. And I f sort of feel guilty because I didn't have to go through that. Whatever I was, they accepted. And there were so many places around, there was a place called Page Three, around the corner from me. And that's where Tiny Tim started. Remember Tiny Tim through through Tulips? I don't know, maybe too young. No, no, I, of course I it, it, Yeah. He lived, he lived right up the block from me. And I used to see him go to work every day. And then there were different kinds of people that could, some of the men that came back from war, they were a little off, but they lived in the village because the village people took care of them. It was never a rich area, not like it is now. It was lower middle class families, and we all helped each other, and uh, I just loved it. It was my home. And what they're doing to it now, I call the Restoration Society history, I get crazy, because what they're doing to the village is a sin. Uh, making it, I mean, when my, my, pa my dad passed away in 2007, he was paying $551. I think the landlord must have did a jig, because I didn't take the apartment. I just didn't want the memories anymore. So when I found out they were charging $7,400 for the new person to come in, and it was a young girl, I said to myself, wow. You know, so that's part of the village scheme. Is there anything in particular that you want me to get well, into? Well, so, so I want to ask you, how do you remember yourself? Like, what, what were you, how do you remember what kind of, like, what kind of kid were you? I was a tomboy. Uh, I loved baseball, uh, bicycle. My father took my bicycle away about three times because I was told not to go in the street. And of course, I got to go in the street. Uh, it was a magic time. It was marbles. It was Spaldines. It was candy stores, mom and pop stores. Um, they were restaurants, family restaurants. They were diners. There was the Lowy's Sheridan, Sheridan Theater where all the kids used to go on a Saturday morning and the grown-ups went at night because they got the blue, blue plates after they watched the movie, they were handed a plate, so my mom made a big set out of blue plates during that particular time in the 50s, early 60s. So it means a lot. Uh, there, were, there were restaurants, I can name some of the restaurants that don't exist anymore, at Cafe Dupree, um, there was a Star Diner, there was Rocco's, there were Mama's on Bleecker Street. There were so many different places that meant a lot. You can't get that anymore. And, oh, John's Pizzeria, which was the first to have the brick oven pizza, and that was on Bleecker Street. And in the Catholic religion, you're not allowed to eat fish in those days, I mean, uh, meat in those days, so you had to have fish. No, we'd have pizza. On Fridays. On Friday night. And what we would do, a whole bunch of us would pile into John's, which was a small place with a Wurlitzer um, jukebox, and the teenagers would be dancing, and the families would be sitting there with pizza, and John would be in the, in the, uh, in the, where the oven is and everything, and served. It was family. It, it was just one big family. And then we had restaurants like Angelina's, where my, one of my father's best friends was Angelina's son, and that was a wonderful restaurant. That's where you had birthdays, funerals, you name it. So it was a it was a kind of a place where you grew up and it was it was nice. It was just a nice time of life for me. And do you remember when you first realized that it was girls that you were attracted to? I think I came out of my mother saying, Ooh, uh, I I think I knew it when I was six years old. I always knew I didn't like girls' clothing. I thought it was obscene to have dresses on with these frills and all sorts of silly things and hats and all. I just said, uh-uh. And they honored that. I'd have to wear a uniform because I went to St. Joseph's School, 27 Chris Street doesn't exist anymore, but they honored that, the idea that I didn't like it. So I'd come home, take my uniform off, put my jeans on or my, my corduroy jeans, a sweatshirt or a shirt, and that'd be it. So I, I, I got that, that feeling that I could express myself, and I did. So I, when, and when I said to my mother for sure, when I was about 12 years old, there was no surprise. There was no, oh, why did you do that? And I have no grandchildren. It didn't matter. 
my mother and father was something you'll know about my mom and dad later when I talk about Stonewall and how extraordinary they were. And these are the unsung, unsung heroes during that particular time, the mothers and fathers that did support their children, and there were quite a few in the village. And what vocabulary did you use? How, do you remember what you, did you know the word lesbian or what? Oh what yeah, you? no, my mother was an English major, forget about it. Words meant a lot to her. And she said to me, you know what it means? And then she read me about Sappho. So I had my education in Sappho when I was about nine years old. Where other kids from out of town didn't know Sappho until they were in their 20s. No, I was nine years old and I knew who Sappho was. And the island of Lesbo. And my mother read everything to me. And my father got me interested. I read books at three, four years old. I guess that's why I went into publishing for 31 years. I got free books. So it was always a thing of knowledge, words, uh, love, compassion. I always had that. I was lucky. Oh, I did some crazy things. My big thing was bringing animals home. And one time I brought a bullfrog home and I had a room. My mother and father gave me a nice room. And I had a note on the door, please knock before entering. My mother said, I have to enter. I have to knock on my own door. No. What do you have in here? And I said, Ma, I have a bullfrog. Well, I said, Ma, look at him. And he went, eh, that was it. I went out the door. So I brought mice in. I brought all sorts of, I was interested in microscopes, chemistry sets, dead flies, bees. Oh, please. I, I, my mother and father should have a, a, a chair in heaven because I wasn't a bad kid, but I was curious, always curious. And my dad, I love my mom, but boy, my dad. He'd come in, and my mom would get him near the door. You know what your daughter did today? And my father would look over at me with a grin on his face, and I'd be standing near my bedroom door. And he'd come in to me, and he'd say, why did you bring the frog home? You know your mother hates frogs. I said, well, I, I like the frog. He, he, Billy Bullfrog. He said, no, forget about Billy Bull, Bullfrog. He said, don't bring anything. He said, I'm not going to punish you. He said, because you really didn't do anything wrong. But don't do that. So my, my dad... My entire life supported me. He threw me in a car at 14. He had a gas station. It was right where 15 Charles Street is now. That was my dad's gas station. And he put me in a car at 14. He said, drive around here. This is my property. So there was never boy things or girl things. It was things that you had to learn. I could take a, par a car apart with him and put it back together by the time I was 14. So it means a lot the way you grow up. And I see it now in the center and in Sage that these people really didn't know how to express themselves. And there's a tremendous amount of people that don't know how to express themselves from the experiences they had from Ohio and Illinois and Michigan. I could never see myself growing up in places like that. Oh my God, that's like death, worse than death. Uh, I don't know if anybody here is, you know, from out of town, but it to me, Growing up in the village was a special time, and it was, and so, it was the, oh, no, no, I'm sorry. It was the time of, of the first transistor radio, and you'd sit on the stoop across the street with a bag of potato chips and listen to it in the summertime. You'd had three cars on Seventh Avenue, not what you see now, and it was it was heaven on earth. You could sit in the street and draw with your chalk. The, the cars never turned on Charles Street. So that was the, the only thing that turned was the good humor man with ice cream. And so you were saying your parents were a socialist or socialistic? Did yes, you? they had socialistic views. And so did you um, grow up with sort of a sense of justice and political action? All my life. All my life. Can you tell me about what form that took when you were growing up? Well, um, we had little things that we used to sell, sell on the curb to the village, kid, village people and stuff. And I was about 11 years old, and my friend Annie Imperata, I think she's passed now, we got the idea that we were going to make a little enterprise for ourselves. So we got a bunch of kids together, and they would go around with papers around the neighborhood that we have lemonade, or we have cookies, or anything in our stand. And if you couldn't pay for it, if you couldn't put the two cents up or whatever, you didn't pay. So I had those ideas at a very early age. And so did my friends, a lot of the friends I grew up with. 
And just a small story, I had a friend, uh, Ronnie but Butler, she was a black woman, a black girl, and we were about, we were young. And we, at the time on 6th Avenue, there was a bus that used to go up to 159th Street. Well, you thought this was a big adventure. So we got on the bus, and in those days, it was 15 cents, a little tiny token that you put in. And uh, we got on the bus, and the bus driver said to us, go in the back. And we looked at him and said, what do you mean go in the back? We want to sit near the window. No, go in the back. So we didn't think much of it, but we shouldn't have been going on to 159th Street. When we got back, her mom, Elvira, and my mom were standing on the corner, and uh, they started to yell, and I said to my mom, I said, Ma, I said, are we supposed to go in the back of the bus? And Elvira and her, look at the, they just looked at each other and said, what are you talking about? And we said, he made us go in the back with our soda and our potato chips. Well, my mother and Elvira were not those type of people. They went to the place, the bus stop, which was on the bus area on 43rd Street in those days, and they, took, they got him fired because he was trying to put the Jim Crow law on us, and we saw that in New York City. So there were still people up that were very prejudiced in those days, and we just couldn't stand for it. And that's the way it was. And we had, there was Harry, the, the uh, laundry man, he was a Chinese with his family in the neighborhood. We used to play as kids. They were teaching me the thing with the, the numbers and everything. We always played together, and there was no difference. That's the difference. And in my village, my village will always be in my heart. It's not now, but that's the way it was. And when the gay issue came along and the feminist issue came along, I was there. I saw the feminist movement from the very beginning, the gay movement was going on a long time, way before me, and way before Stonewall. And Stonewall was the pinnacle, the, the, the thing that opened it up. But they, were, they suffered a lot before that. There was the three objects that you had to have on you, even when I was young. They used to, the police used to come and snap your bra. If you didn't have bra on, well, you could make a nice trip to the 6th Precinct. So they were rough, and you always carried your identification in your shoe, never on your body. All sorts of things. If they found one of the fellas with a ruffled handkerchief or something, they'd really go at them. Tell me, why did you keep your ID in your shoe? Because they, could, they couldn't go into that area. They couldn't go into our pockets. They would say, take whatever you got in your pockets out, and you had to show them. So if you had your identification, they knew who you were. This way, they didn't know who you were and they'd let you go. You were, you, we were kids, we were young. So it, it, it was that type of thing. So, and how did you learn how to deal with the police? I'm so sorry. We learned early on, being gay and, and being in Greenwich Village, which I think some of the cops in those days, they were staunch Irish. And they didn't like the idea of, of the village, you know, I mean, with the freeness that we had there. So they were rough not only on the gays, not only the lesbians, but they were rough on a lot of people. If you was, we had a guy that used to dress up like Shakespeare. He was from a rich family. But what would you do if you come from Michigan? You send him to the village. Then we had another guy that dressed all in leather. And he had a little beard. He used to stand on Greenwich Avenue and, and 6th Avenue every Saturday morning. A car would come up with black glass, open it up this much, hand him an envelope and take off. He was the Kellogg grandson. This is what the village meant to these people, that they could come to a place where they were comfortable. And the people that didn't want them, where did they send them? The village. So we had a lot of that. We had a lot of people. I had a man that was in the village that he used to wear a Panama hat, white suit, and, and walk a skunk. I grew up with the skunk. He was an awful, adorable little guy. So there was always characters. There were, there were a German couple that had a material store away, uh, right across the street from Charles Street. They had a little dachshund that used to bathe itself in the sun every day, the most adorable thing. And she'd be with her, her, her sewing machine in the window making scarves and sweaters and jackets. There was a Jewish couple around the corner near uh, Bleecker Street. It was an Army-Navy store. 
Everybody got their jeans there because it was always too long for you and they were so stiff in those days, the old-fashioned jeans. And she would take it up for you. It would cost nothing. There was the mom and pop stores that used to have, if you didn't have the two cents for a plain, what they call a plain vanilla, he would say, all right, give it to me next week. There was Molly's candy store, which was right on West 4th Street, a little tiny store that she and her sister used to have. We'd buy our comics book there, uh, Mad Magazine. There was also Ro Rosie's uh, right on the corner, uh, right next to St. Vincent's was here. There's like a corner there, and there was her store. And when I was f about 13, I got rheumatic fever very bad. And uh, I was home for a few months. And after that, the doctor wanted me, in those days, malts with egg in it. And she would make it for me every single day, Rosie. She would make a vanilla malted with an egg in it. If you didn't have the money, well, next week. So it was that kind of neighborhood. Do you remember the first um, relationship you had with a girl? Yeah. Can you tell me about I that? I sure do. Not mention the name because she might be still in... She was from the Bronx. I could say she went to St. Barnabas. She knows who it is if she's still around. And uh, oh, One second. Whose phone is that? One second, I'm just going to go check with Margaret about the phone. All right, just tell her, not, just to take it off the hook. Yeah. Margaret, can you? Yeah, she's, she's got it. I'm sorry. No worries. You want some water? No, I'm fine, thank you. Oh, do you want some grapes? I'm asking Zach. He looks oh, like he's okay. about to um, take some grapes. Drums. And you, I have some water here too. Yeah, sure. Okay, here you go. I got one. Help yourself. There's glasses in the closet. Thank you. So take much. a glass. Take water. Thank you. There's Barbara. juices. There's a. Uh, cranberry apple juice, a small bottle oh, in so there. Nice. Take the take three out for you guys. We're good with water. Thanks. Thank you. You're welcome. You're right. Do you need to one second? Need a second? Uh, we'll, we'll see. Let's see. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you so your first relationship was oh. somebody you don't want to name. How old were you? Uh, about fourteen. About fourteen, going on fifteen, and. It was a, it was a, e e experiment. You know what I mean? We were just trying to find out about each other, and um, we really liked each other. And it was a, a, more of a companion than anything. You know what, Barbara? The, I'm sorry, I'm gonna stop you again. It's something so loud is happening outside. Oh, uh, tell them we're filming. They're doing some kind of cleaning or something. Just tell them that oh. Barbara is filming. You know what? I think it's actually outside. Oh, so that I can't control. Yeah, I don't think it's the hallway. Is I think it, it's. Is it just a street cleaner or something? They're always. Are we facing they, the back? They're always building. I think they're building a pyramid yeah. back there. They might be. Who knows? <laughs> I'm telling you, all they do around here is build. Yeah, you want a grape? Okay. Yes, yeah, like construction. All right. I'm sorry. What are we going to do, Zach? Done. They're like, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so. I'm sorry. So, tell me again about your first oh, sure. relationship. Oh, sure. Yeah. Um, she was from the Bronx, uh, went to St. Bonneville School, and uh, we were about 14, 15, I guess. And uh, it was companionship, a little kissing, hugging, you know, experimenting, really, and learning about each other. And it felt good. And, uh, and then after that, it was just okay, you know? And my mom and dad, they, they were very good about it. They invited her to dinner, and it was really nice. Uh, I was never invited up to her place. She, all the way in the Bronx, no. But um, it, it, was, it was okay with my mom and dad, and it was okay with me. And it just, from there, it just slid into my teenagehood and my adulthood and that was it you know which not hard so tell me about what was your life like in the 60s as you were sort of an older teen oh wow 
Well, there was West Third Street. And West Third Street was a magic place. It was a place where all the kids from everywhere, New Jersey, the Bronx, Brooklyn, every, hung out. You'd get your pea coat on, your bell bottoms, your boots, your sunglasses, the long hair. I mean, this was heaven. And we hung out. We were, you know, a typical kid. We're walking up and down freezing weather, but they were all the cafes. And so they were. I'm going to stop you again. It's so, I'm sorry, it's so loud out there. I know there's no. I, I, no, I don't it's know. It's okay. We're just going to so wait a minute. When, when we heard that again, we just paused for like five minutes. Yeah, or okay. Like whatever. Yeah. Sure. Be gone, we started again. So every time you hear that, we're just like, let's stop. Sure. <laughs> you don't know how long it's going to go on. Yeah. So how old were you when you were hanging out on West 3rd Street? 16. And 15, say, getting off 15 into 16. And my best friend Susan and I, after school, we'd go over there. We were supposed to be home early, but, well, we didn't do certain things. But we'd be over there and be walking up and down. And I'll just give you an idea. Café Wa where Jimi Hendrix started. Well, Jimi Hendrix was a friend of ours. And in those days, he had an apartment on 17th Street, and he was living with a woman named Karen. And we used to go up there after his gigs and play cards and sit and have, you know, soda or whatever. That's a long time ago. And uh, the Love and Spoonful, uh, I'm going to say this, and it's going to embarrass Susan if she ever... Uh, Susan was a very pretty woman, a very pretty girl. And uh, uh, there were two of them in it. I'm not going to name their names, but they, one of them had a, a big crush on her, and the other one wrote a song about her. And it got pretty big in Younger Girl. If you ever hear that by the Love and Spoonful, it's about my friend Susan. Nice. And we hung out, I guess, we're still friends. We still call each other. She's on her fourth marriage. We won't talk about that. And uh, she lives near Pennsylvania, on the tip over there. And we talk, and after every conversation, we say, I love you. And that's what people have to learn to do, because those times are precious. And even she says to me sometimes, would anybody believe who, who we knew? And I said, you know what? As long as we know. So it, it was a kind of thing we hung out. I saw Laura Nero in Figaro's writing. I saw all sorts of different, Eric Jacobson, who was a producer for Apple Records, come in. And my friend Lorraine had a, a big voice, but she was shy. So they took, they wanted her for a group called Spanky and Our Gang. And some days will never be the same, you, you must know it. Mm -hmm. So there was always that kind of um, things that were happening, notary, uh, uh, how would you say, people that were discovered in those days too. Uh, Bob Dylan was around, he, would li he lived around a corner at that time. Uh, there were just so many, so many experiences. And uh, wow, it was great on Third Street. And then there were the cafes where we hung out. We hung out in Rienzi's, we used to sit there and, and we'd get soda, or coffee, or tea, a salad. And there was a humorous thing here. There was a place called the Lost Coin. And we were kids, so anything free was great. So well, let's if stop you. For a second. Okay. Something's going on out there. Well, They're building. They're building. Uh, should I go on? Yes. So we used to go to the Lost Coin, and what it was is a bunch of women that called themselves sister, Anne, sister, whatever, and they were like you know, the holy rollers. And if you went down and listened to their spiel, you would get a donut and a free coffee. So on a cold night, we'd all go down there. We were kids, and we'd listen to the mile a minute, and we'd be eating the, the donuts and the coffee. And it, it just, Third Street was a magic place even in those days. We had the Gaslight, which a lot of performers uh, were at. We had Gertie Spoke City, which so many people started in there. Peter, Paul, and Mary, Phil Oaks, uh, Paxton, they all started in that. So even off of Charles Street, I was still in Magicville in the village. 
There was the Waverly Theater. Now I think it's IFC or something, mm -hmm. but it was originally the Waverly Theater. And you'd get a lot of foreign movies and a lot of good movies. You had the Art Theater off of 8th Street. That was the first theater that had a hard day's night for the Beatles. And there was Needix that was on 6th Avenue, Hot, hot Dogs. There was Woolworths. There was uh, Howard Johnson's. There was Lorf's Candy on the corner. There was the original Balducci's with John and Marie, which was a big open area right on Greenwich Avenue. And John would come out when I was a, a small and say, bring this to your mother. And what it was with the, 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 the greens from the vegetables. And my mother used to make soup out of it. So these were legends that came out of the village. And you have also Bigelow's. That was your drugstore all, all, all your life. There was only two. There was the Grove drugstore and there was Bigelow's. Now it's like it's like all over, but not in those days. So let me ask you, tell me about when you started kind of living, because um, maybe you were a teenager still, kind of going to bars and kind of living in a... I'm getting living. myself in trouble. We had false IDs. I think everybody did in those days, you know. And were we, you going to lesbian bars? Sure, the Duchess, Giovanni's. Could you uh, tell me what they were like? Describe, like. Well, the Duchess was downstairs. The majority report was upstairs, so it was great. The, the newspaper was upstairs after we worked and did our things. We'd come down to the Duchess at night. So, and then you had Giovanni's. Was on nineteenth. There was Marie, and um, her mom, and uh, that was a great bar. And then you had Kelly's. Kelly's was near Leroy Street. So tell me, what were you doing at the bar? Were you drinking? Were you dancing? No, I was never a drinker. I mean, I tried it a couple of times and I didn't like it. So it was more or less a congregation, you know, a socialization. Everybody would talk and gossip and, 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 and who you're going to date and who you're bringing here. And it was just a, you know, a way of life. And it was nice. And everybody knew each other. There's not too many that are left from that era. And were you being careful about making sure you weren't wearing three pieces of clothing that would get you in trouble? Or did you ignore we, that? No, we never ignored it. We never ignored it. Uh, it was tough to, you didn't know. If somebody was going to say something or do something, you still had to be careful. Um, there were always fights outside the bars, especially the Duchess. Uh, they would come around with cars, these toughy guys, and start to taunt everybody. It was rough. It wasn't easy. So we always kept our cool as much as we could. What did you wear? Oh, in those days, uh, jeans, boots, pl flannel shirts, pea coats, uh, always a, a hat, a pullover hat. Um, just regular things, mostly men's clothing. We never wore. Women's were too frilly and too delicate. My, mo my father used to say, being in clothing, he said, never buy women's stuff. It, it's too chintzy. So get men's stuff. It'll last longer. So all my life, um, I wear uh, medium men's shirts, uh, little boy husky pants, uh, sneakers. I get little boys because I'm able to get into four and a half fives. So all my life, I never knew anything else. And that was the way I grew up. And my friends grew up that way because they were villagers. And did you, I, other women have told me that they were really careful. So for instance, they would either only use their first name or they would use a pseudonym. Did you? No, I never did that. No, I always used my name. I didn't use my last name, uh, but I'd say I'm Barbara, but I never, felt that I had to put that in the way. I found it more with kids that grew up someplace else rather than the village. That I did here. They always wanted to go under different names. Who wanted to be called, uh, like I said, Sunny, and her real name was Anne. Uh, Blackie, and her real name was something else. So it was always that type of thing, and I think the older lesbians felt that they had to do that because of their family ties, or they weren't tied to their family anymore. It always was something. But for me, I never had to do that. I was just fortunate. And what did you do after high school? High school, I went to work. 
My parents couldn't afford college for me, so I got college after I started to work for Rizzoli's, and they helped me along, and I did get a degree in history. But my parents couldn't afford that. When, when, when movies went from 18 cents to 22 cents, my mother said, what is the world coming to? So there was no way I was going to get a, a... My mom and dad, I went to work. And my mom was sick in those years, and that, that gets a lot to Stonewall, which I will get to. My mom was in and out of hospitals for years, cancer, thyroid cancer, stomach, all sorts of things. So my dad and I would scurry around getting extra jobs, uh, working in restaurants, uh, whatever I can do. I did bank disbursement books down the Kansas Meat Company. Uh, at night, my dad used to wait for me from 8 to 12 midnight, and I used to do these books and everything at night. I learned it myself. So it wasn't easy for my family, and I went to work. I worked for Rizzoli International Publications, and I loved it there. But then they went out, and another company brought them up, and then I worked for E.P. Dutton Publishing Company, which was my home. Uh, my boss was incredible, Shirley Thorne. I hope she can see this one day. Uh, she was a big, black, beautiful woman. And boy, could she dress. She was, she was incredible. Uh, and, and, and it was easy to work there because it was gay. It was, publishing is one place where gay people would be drawn to because there was no prejudice. There was no, all kinds of people worked in publishing in my day. I don't know now because everything is so corporate, but in those days it was different. You know, and my reasoning was I could get all the books I want. I'd call up a company, uh, it's EP, can you send a copy over it, blah, 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 and they would. I met a lot of authors. Um, and did you feel like you didn't have to hide your identity at work? Never had. My Pat was always welcomed. She was welcomed from the day one. Joe Cannon, our president, had all everybody's partners up there. Uh, the big boss, Ivor Winston, uh, Whitson, it didn't matter. And that was the beauty. I had a charmed career. Pat had some time because she worked for a place called Standard and Poor's. So she had a dress code for a long time. And she was sort of edgy for a while. But then when I started to appear, uh, that's another story. In between Rizzoli and Dutton, I was out for about six months before I could go to Dutton. And my, uh, my Aunt Gloria worked in Sandin and Poor. She said, why don't you come over here for a few months until your job is ready? And I said, sure. So my, my aunt's friends, they, they didn't care, gay, anything. They were, it was family. And so I'm sitting there, and I see this woman come in, and it was like, oh, wow. But I didn't say anything. But that afternoon, at, in the cafeteria, I was standing there getting my lunch. It was a big cafeteria. And somebody banged my tray. And I turned around, and I looked, and I said, hi. And she said, hello. And it was Pat. And after that, I saw how she always ate alone with a book in her hand. And we started to talk to each other, and I sat with her for lunch. And my aunt said to me, go, go. You want to sit with her, go. And my Aunt Gloria, God rest her soul, she, they were my whole family. They were always supportive. I just have to tell you this. We had a party at my, my cousin Pam's house at one time. And Pat, my Aunt Terry, my Aunt Glory, my Aunt Mary, my dad, my cousin, we were all together. And my Aunt Terry, who was a ruffian, she said, what are you doing over there? Get over here, your family, to Pat. Her mom and dad didn't want her, but my family did. And, and did. she got tears in her eyes and she came over and my Aunt, my Aunt Terry and my dad put their arms around her. They didn't want her because she was a lesbian? They didn't want to leave her out. She was family. Yeah, but I mean, Pat, Pat's own family didn't want her. No, no. Her mom told her when she was young that she really didn't want her, and her father used to beat her. So she never knew the love of her family until she got into my family. What year did you meet her? We met in the end, I guess, let's see, 78. Okay. It had to be 78. Okay. It was 80 I started Dutton, yeah. It had to be the end of 78 going into 79. It had to be around there. 
And uh, they just accepted her. And that was the beauty of my family. And I know I'm bragging about them, but I want to brag about them because I want the young ones today to know that you can communicate with your, with hopefully with your, your mom and dad or family. There is a way of doing it. So tell me about, let's go back to the 60s for a minute. Sure. Uh, more than a minute. Tell me, were you involved with any women's groups? Were you, were you involved, did you ever go to Daughters of Belitis, for instance? Uh, in those days, in the 60s, there were more men's groups. The women were hiding. They, they, they didn't come out as much. Um, there were some groups around, but it was, there was the Daughters of Belitis, which came from Boston. And they were strict lesbian. And they were a group my friend Rose Jordan was part of it, but I wasn't. I was more or less in, I hate this, in the hippie generation, where we were more open with each other and we talked to each other and who was gay, who was straight, who was bi, who was trans, it didn't matter. And those were the 60s where it was free love, but the free love we, I didn't do, but it was there. We saw the opening in the village, and we as young people tried to keep it as open as possible. There were kids that used to come in from Jersey when we were hanging on Third Street, and I used to bring them home. And my mom would say, all right, put them on the couch. That's the way my mom and dad were. They didn't even want to go home because they saw the freedom. They saw my mom and dad, dad accepting them. You know how many trunks were in the back room in my room? My mom would say, just take this stuff, put it in the back room. That's the way they were. It was a, 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 a time where if I could do anything for them, I did. There was my friend Jerry that his father threw him out. We took him in. Uh, that was the 60s, the hippie generation, the anti-war movement, the feminist movement was just starting to come in. The gay movement was ahead of us. The men were ahead of us in a lot of ways. The women were more or less hidden. It was harder for the women to come out than the men. The men were still, you know, uh, hi Mary, how are you, you know, and do the hot thing and, you know, they were there. Like one of my friends, they were hot stuff. There was one guy, he passed away in the AIDS Christ. But he used to come, and I won't tell you, but he had a button in his mouth and it said F-U-C-K. They were crazy, but they could get away with it more than the women. There used to be a place on 6th Avenue on 8th Street called Pam Pams. Everybody hung out there. Uh, even Johnny Mathis, the singer, he used to come with his pink Cadillac and be in front of Pam Pams all the time. There was, it was an openness for the men, but not the women. When, at the stone wall, the women were more evident we could come out on the corner and talk about what we were going to do, what we were going to plan. That we did. But before that, it was a little more close for the women, more open for the men. So tell me about Stonewall. Stonewall was a bar, and not what you see now. It was a different kind of front. Uh, they, they described to me what it looks like now. And it was really a hangout for a lot of the gay men. A few of the bull dykes used to go in there. Uh, the, the lesbian women didn't go in so much, not as much as the men did. And that's where the trans and the drag queens would go. There was an 82 club, if you ever heard of it. And the drag queens from the 82 club used to come over some nights and be there. Our exposure, the women's, were not exposed until after Stonewall. So, and I remember the Stonewall night. It was a warm night, and my friend Susan and I, there was a bride's ice cream on the corner of Christopher and West 10. And I'm walking, we're walking up, and I see all the guys hanging out with cameras. There was the Voice newspaper at that time. And I looked up and I said, he says around the corner, Stonewall. And there were horses, there were cars, there was the, there was the police there and everything. And a lot of my friends came running over. My friend Jerry Newton, he came running over. He said, they're killing us over there. I said, what's going on? He said, the cops are all over. And I looked around, they were all over the place. And they're starting to pick on a lot of people. 
A lot of people got hurt that night, mostly the drag queens and mostly the trans. We don't talk about that much. There was an organization called STAR. You look that up. And they're the ones that started this whole thing. Sylvia Rivera, Marsha Johnson. These are the people that were Joe, uh, Big Joe that's still at Sage. These are the people that were at Stonewall. And the, the, that's the truth of the matter. And so did you know them at the time? Yeah, yeah. How did you know them? Oh my God, the neighborhood. They were in the neighborhood. They used to go to different restaurants. There was a thing called Jean pa Jean's Patio, which was right on the corner of Charles and Greenwich Avenue. And at night, everybody would go in there, all the drag queens, the trans, everybody, me, my friend Bobby Byrne, my best friend, oh, I miss you so much, my best friend in the world. And we would go there at night, and Jean would shut the door, put the shades down, and we can eat in peace. Nobody bothered us. We were able to have fun. We'd sing and talk, and that's how we knew each other. We always knew each other. And had you been to the Stonewall? I was in front of it. I was in it once, a long, long time ago, and then after that, I was in it a lot during the time of different campaigns. I was there with Yetta Curlin when I worked for her, uh, way before that, with some friends whose birthday it was. We would go in, um, things like that. I didn't hang out in there, but I knew of it, and I had friends that went in there. So, so let's go back to that night. Do you remember what you thought when you realized something was happening? I saw chaos. It was scary. And what happened, there was the Riviera restaurant right here. And all of a sudden, I saw in the distance my father coming down. I remember his white shirt and gray pants. And he said, come on, get your friends. We're going over to the house. So we had collected a lot of the trans and the drag queen and everything. And we're going back to the house. Who was bleeding? Who was this? Who was that? And my father knew the policeman. He knew everybody in the neighborhood. They called him the mayor of the village, my, my dad. And he said, why are you? He said, leave them alone. He said, no, we got to get them out of the neighborhood. They're, they're doing too many things, blah, 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 blah. And my father said, no, no way. So he said, Vinny, you do what you want. I'm not going to say the captain's name at the time, but he was, he was ruthless at that time. And my dad collected a lot of my friends and everything. We went back to the house. And my mom made a little triage in the kitchen, a small kitchen. And my dad called up their friends and mothers and father, whoever, who slept on blankets, who slept on here. And that night, my mom fed them, and we talked about what we have to do. We've got to stop this. It was just too much. Just going a little fast forward for the moment. My mom had a massive heart attack in 1985, March 25, 1985. And she was brought to St. Vincent's, and Pat and I were living in, in, in Staten Island at the time. We lived there for a year. And I got in the car, and I was going, 90, I was going so fast over that Verrazano Bridge to get to my mom. And Staten Island cops, which were not good, from the 120th Precinct, stopped the car. They said, where are you going? You're going to, I said, I started to cry. And he looked at me, and he looked at Pat hysterical. He said, we'll get you there. Cop's car got in front, one in the back. They got us there in 20 minutes. They were very respectful. They came into the emergency room with their hats off. They said, go to your mom. And I went over, my dad was hysterical. And they said, we have no room. And I said, what do you mean? He said, with the AIDS crisis, we have no room. So my father looked and he said, my, the doctor at the time, Dr. Everly said, Vindy, we only have room in the AIDS ward. And my dad looked at me and I said, he looked said, you think? I said, yeah. She was among friends. It was a big rotunda with all the AIDS patients, a lot of my friends and a lot of her friends. She died that night at 115 among friends. And I will never forget that. And talk about angels in America, well, they were around her at that moment. So I will never forget them, and I'll never forget that war. People should, if they think they're too big for this life, they should have just gone in that war at that time. And let me tell you about St. Vincent's. St. Vincent's is gone, but it's in my heart and a lot of other people. They didn't use gloves or anything, those doctors and nurses. 
they went in there raw and they took care of those people. And that's why when St. Vincent's went, came down, I went at Christine Quinn like a maniac. I said, you can't do this. There's no way you can do it. And they did it. What did they make it for rich, rich people? A co-op. Yeah. That's a sin. That started from a little, little tiny house, St. Vincent's, a little red building. And I think it's a sin what they did to the village. They took the aviance, everything away from it. And those people, I hope they're haunting that damn place up to the kazoo because I think it's a sin what they did. These people have no hearts. They say they do, and there's a very famous celebrity that went in there and bought a co-op, and she's gay, and she should be ashamed of herself, and she knows who she is. So I think it's wrong. I always will be that way. I'm outspoken from the day one. That's how I lived my life. But I saw those guys suffer. I lost my best, best friend, Bobby Byrne, to AIDS. I lost Marl. I lost Gary. I lost so many to AIDS. It's not funny. And they were good guys. They just were in the wrong place at the wrong time. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry to get off on no, that jag. No, no. I, I, I want to let us just sit with that for a minute. So let's go back to the Stonewall time. Yep. So that night, you brought came home with some friends and... and we decided we weren't going to take it anymore. Did you go um, the, to the other nights of protest? Many nights of protest. Many nights. In the cold, in the heat, day after day, month after month. The first, the first march, that was a hoot on 6th Avenue. We had to stay on the friggin' sidewalks. Tell me about that. Tell me about, tell me about that year, kind of from the... Of uh, what, uh, what I can remember, we tried, all of us, there weren't many of us, you know, it I'm wasn't exactly a gaggle of people. I'm sorry, I'm going to stop for a second. I'm so sorry. I just need to stop oh, this you know what, the, um, as I was saying, the data, the film is such oh, high quality, yeah, so that yeah. now they're changing the data card. Oh, okay. It could be the, the Jeopardy thing. Da, 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 Would you da, 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 like, oh, exactly. Would you yeah, like some water or a No, I'm or fine. Anything? I'm you fine. Could? Yeah, just, I'm sorry I got off on that, that. No, don't be sorry at all. It, it just, it, it hurts a lot. Mm -hmm. It just hurts a lot. I know. And sorry. I see that, well, I'll, I'll say it when it's on, what I feel. Are we on again? Yeah, we're, we're Okay, we're back. Okay, well, after that, after that day, we had maybe, it was maybe a hundred people, maybe less. Uh, there were a few women, it was mostly men at the time, and we walked up 6th Avenue, and I forget where we dispersed. I remember we walked up a, a, not too far at that particular time. The year after was practically the same thing, but as we went along, and as more and more people came into view and realized what was happening, and the voice did a lot in those days, when they were free, when they were the, the reporters were much more free. We didn't have the gay news or anything like that. We had the voice. And they did a lot of uh, articles and different things. They didn't go into the whole uh, thing with Stonewall. It was mentioned. It wasn't mentioned in the local news, not that I know of. So it was there. And as the years went by, it became bigger and bigger. And I think one of the biggest was the 70... Five March, I think it was the 75 March was one of the biggest, and we used to go up to Central Park at those days, and you could look right down, and it was just miles and miles of people, and Quentin Crisp, that's how I know the year, it had to be 75, or the beginning of, or June of 76, I'm not sure, but Quentin Crisp was in the crowd, do you know who he is? I don't. The civil servant? He was a man from England, and he dressed with one of those chapeau hats and a pink scarf and everything with makeup. Uh -huh. He was, The Civil Servant is a, it was a show also on Channel 13 about his life. And he was a gay man that used to be, oh my God, tortured in England. And he wrote the book, The Civil Servant. And he came to one of the marches. I think it had to be 75 or 76. And, and I, was, I was talking to him in the march. 
what a lovely man, but he went through a lot. So there were, there were a lot of things in between that particular time that the gay women, the lesbian women, were starting to get together. And I gotta say, in the beginning it was pretty rough because the women just had fears. You, you know, you gotta remember that we were afraid of rape. We were afraid of, of, of fondling, all sorts of things. And it did happen. So we had to be careful doing the things we did. The men, like I said, were more free at the time. Did you get involved with any groups at that time? Did you join the Gay Activist Alliance or, um, or, or a Women's Consciousness Raising Group? Was oh, any of that many, many CR groups in Brooklyn, mostly in Brooklyn at the time. And yeah, we used to go to the CR groups and there were different organizations that were coming up. I worked mainly in Majority Report. Uh, I worked with, uh, uh, with uh, Rose and with WBAI. I gave ideas to her. Uh, there weren't that many good organizations. And the organizations you know that... What? We're going to stop for a second because now oh, I'm there's sorry. somebody yeah, No, not you, not you at all. I'm sorry that we keep interrupting no, you. No, no. For blind people and disabled, they sure make noise. <laughs> Jesus, I'm telling you. So tell me about the consciousness raising groups. So consciousness raising, there? yeah. You, somebody would, would give their, their home and we would go in and it wouldn't be maybe 10 women or less and we would talk about our troubles and how we felt about things and where we were going. And they were wonderful groups. And I gotta say this, is we try to bring back the CR groups, Christian and Sage, and myself, who's, she's a transsexual. She's my partner in crime there. She's the head of the women's programming, which has gotten a lot of flack. And that's another thing I wanna talk about, which I'm very disappointed in the women, the lesbian women, and they're gonna get me for this because they've been getting me for a long time. Oops. Sorry. They do sing in the hallway, I'm sorry. No, you don't need to be sorry for anything at all. But, but any, can I go? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the lesbian women, and I wanna talk about present because this is what's been bothering me. I'll give you more of the, of the, of the past. But the future looks dim for the lesbian community if they don't wake up. The transsexual community, community the gay men, we have to work together because what's, be, what's happening is becoming corporate. It is killing the real tradition of SAGE, the LGBT center, which is not as influenced as SAGE's. And I see for myself there was a war that went between the lesbian women themselves because of the transsexual being ahead of the women's programming. And I think she's doing an incredible job. And I think that they should open their eyes and come to the conclusion that we need each other. It's a bad world out there. We can't get anywhere without each other. And if they have the strength right now, and if they have the know-how, we need them. So that's what I'm saying to the lesbian community right now. Wake up. Let's work together, otherwise we're doomed. Yeah, it's interesting that there that that's something that's still up for discussion. Yeah, it's it's getting. I I find it very hairy because what I'm telling you, what happened in the past, a lot of these lesbian women never went through it, never went through it, and they're the ones demanding the different things that are happening within Sage or the LGBT Center. And I think it's wrong because they got to wake up. They have to wake up and see, we suffered for it. We stopped the snuff films on 42nd Street, freezing our tush off at night, trying to get these guys with briefcases going into the snuff films, and we all know what snuff films are, killing women in real life in different countries. So we, we stood out there, and we were the ones that fought it. Half of these women, they come in from different places, they have no idea about the heritage or any of our background in the city of New York. How we fought, the lesbian community fought, most of them are gone. 
That's the big problem. We have a, a flock out there that are either rich or they are just want a little, a little uh, amount of people, what do you call them, like little cults? Mm -hmm. It's killing the movement. It's killing SAGE, it's killing the LGBT center. Not as much as SAGE. And I have to say that because I love the organization, I'm there 38 years, and I want it to be remembered for the, the accomplishments that Christine and the other women did in the early days. They put their neck on the line, especially Christine, who was the only woman among men to establish SAGE. And I carried, I was in the second tier, and I was to carry on with a few of the other women. And that is very important to me. But the women we have now, I'm very disappointed. So I'm confused because I think of SAGE as being a group for seniors. It is seniors. So what were you doing there 38 years ago? We had to establish it, something. We sat around, and especially Christine was the one that said, hey, we're going to get there one day. We need an organization. And she did it. She got a degree. She became a social worker. And she was the only women, woman in the board of directors at one time. But slowly but surely, she got out. And it became a, woman, a, a men's organization again. And then there were a lot of women that went in and out. And when I joined, there weren't that many women as it was. It was mainly men at that particular time. And it, it changed over the years, but there was still, still that male presence. And it still is to this day. It, it, there's a male presence. There are women that are in, in different positions. But thank God for the transsexual, because they're in the main positions now, not the lesbian women because they never came forward to get the jobs. They never came forward to do anything about the jobs. So the transsexual came in, and I'm happy. So, but it's meant to be... For the senior population, which it is. It is for the senior population. Men and women and Men, trans. we're now in open domain, so everybody has, can come in. Straights, gays, it doesn't matter. That's another bugaboo that we have, but we have DIFTA, and they rule us. So whatever happens in SAGE is because of DIFTA. We work on a point system. I and don't that, know what DIFTA is. Can you tell me? Uh, Department of the Aging. I see. So they more or less, they're the ones that get us the grants or whatever it has to be to keep us going, the programs, um, the different things that SAGE does. It became a huge organization, which is wonderful. But we took our, what was behind, and we sort of left it behind. And the, the, I, I go there every day, every night, and I sit with people that come in for the meals, they come in for the social activity, you know, sitting there with the people. But the real meaning of SAGE, excuse me, is gone. And it was for the senior people, it was for the gay community. When we became an open domain, we couldn't do that anymore. So yes, it's a senior organization, but not strictly for gays anymore. Not strictly for lesbians anymore. It's everybody. So I don't know. Yes, it's good, we got to keep up with the times, but we're losing a little bit of our actual name, Senior Action in a Gay Environment. That's our real initials. But now we're advocacy, and we're this, and we're that. So we've changed a lot. I mean, I accept it, but at the same time, I'm seeing these people come in every single night, and they pay for nothing, and some of them are multimillionaires, and they sit there and eat the meals every night, and they don't do a damn thing for SAGE. They do nothing for the LGBT center. I don't even think half of them know what it is. That's what aggravates me. I, I have been... Fighting it, that is one thing that from my experience from Stonewall and the first march and the second march and the third and so on and working with different people, the dignity and the Marachin, I can't say the word, uh, organization. The Marachin? Thank you. Uh, sometimes it gets lost in my head. And different organizations, the MCC Church, which was incredible in the very beginning. 
uh, the, the pastor was Reverend Maud Fragona and O'Shea, who I met a few months ago. Uh, we were at a, at a uh, it was a protest because a trans woman was killed on 27th Street. This was during the winter time last year. Yes, recently. And uh, I was standing there with a friend of mine, and Reverend O'Shea says, oh my God, Barbara Police. And I said, I said, I can't see anymore. And he hugged me. I didn't see him in like 40 years. So we talked a few minutes. He said, how is everything going? I said, I'm with Sage now. He says, good organization. He said, but they better stay the same. I said, uh-uh. So I see the old timers that really were involved at that time. There's not many left. And that's what bothers me. And until we have a plaque on that wall in Sage or in the LGBT Center honoring these people, like Marsha, like Sylvia, like Jerry Hoos, even me and Rose Jordan, who were out there in the trenches a long time before anybody else. These are the people that should be. Star, the organization. Joe, tall Joe. These are the people that should be honored now, but they don't do it. They don't recognize us. It's great to say that Stonewall is going to be 50 years next year, but what about the people that are left? It's great to make a book up, and I was in publishing, and make lots of dough, but is it the real thing inside that book? Free of the press so they can put anything they want down. But is it the truth? Half of them I fought with that try to publish books and everything. I said, that's not how it is. So you've got to remember that, you know, they said that the bull dykes were in, in Stonewall. No, nope. it was the bull dykes that were outside trying to keep the cops in Stonewall. That's the truth of the matter. And when you read history, it's always wrong. That's what gets me mad. I was born and raised in the village. And I can tell you about Stonewall, and I can tell you about all the movements before that, and all the movements after it. But they don't honor the people that are left, and that's what aggravates me. Tell me about the Majority Report. What was that? Majority Report was a woman's newspaper. It was owned by Joanne Steele. Um, she's still my friend, my friend Joanne, and we always will be friends. She lives in Kingston, New York now. She's not well. We talk all the time. She came down here last year, but she has COPD now, very bad, so she can't uh, get down here. But she came to Sage, and we talked about different groups were Christian, but the women didn't come forward. The lesbians of now did not come forward. They don't even know our history. That's what gets me angry. So Joanne said to me, what are we going to do? We were going to bring down some majority reports, but what's the sense of it? So when was majority report um, coming out, and who was reading it, and what was it covering? It was, okay, we had newspaper stands in those days, uh, the wooden newspaper stands, that Joanne and distribution, there was Josie, there was me, whoever was available at the time, we used to get a bunch of newspapers and go to the different stands, and it was a quarter, 25 cents to buy a majority report. How often did it get published? It was every week, every two weeks, whenever we can get a publishing date. In, in the 70s? 70s, yep. And was it specifically about Lesbian New York? It was Lesbian New York. We had, a, we had an incredible uh, section that said, Lo know your local rap rapist. And that, that spurred a thing called Take Back the Night, which was in Central Park. And I think I told you earlier, is that was the march that we had these guys coming out and throwing stones at us and everything that night. We had little candles, and we were walking, and they were harassing us. But thank God we had a bunch of women cops behind us, and they took off after them. But they always wanted to spoil. We went into a church up there near Central Park, and we sat there. We were shaking because it was so dangerous at that time. What year was that? Oh, Lordy. 75? Had to be 75. It wasn't here, because I always do things by the centennial, 76. So I know what was before and what was after, but it was before. So it had to be 75. And a lot of women were on that march. We had the reason for it. There was a rapist in the city that was getting through, he was called a bathroom robber, the bathroom rapist. He was a skinny guy, black guy, 
that would get through the bathroom windows. And in the bathroom, some of the apartments had those little windows. I don't know if you ever saw them in the village. Mm -hmm. And he would get through those windows and rape. And after a while, they finally got him after about maybe about 15 rapes. So we knew that night that we had to put on, because it wasn't in the newspapers, it wasn't anywhere. It was like, you know, not there. So we did that march that night, we kept it up. And so what else was in the majority report? What other kinds of stuff did it cover? Oh, uh, articles about, um, about the places we could go. There was a place called, a, a woman's place, that was in Atoll, New York. They used to call it Asshole, New York. <laughs> Because it was just a little, like a little, a little farmhouse with an out, out area. But the women went up there to have, you know, vacation time. We had a woman's ways, which was a big chalet. And we would go up there, and uh, if you worked it, you didn't have to pay. So all of us, who would cook, who would clean, who would, you know, grow the stuff in the back. And that's how it existed. But they didn't stay up too long. It was a shame. A lot of the women's places, there was a thing called Falls Village. Uh, a woman that was rich opened it up and we would go there and we would have a very good time there. It closed up. And before the majority report, did you read the latter? No. No? No. I had my paper, it wasn't a gay paper, but it was the villager. And that was free in every hallway in the village. So we would get a lot of our information about the gay community or any community in the villager. If you want to look, you can look at some of the old articles and things that were in the villager okay. uh, at the Jefferson uh, Market Library. They have everything there. Mm -hmm. So and that was where you were getting your information? Yeah. And plus the street. You know, we got a lot of our information from each other. And uh, they were, you know, we, like on 8th Street and 6th Avenue, you could go over there in an afternoon, on a Saturday afternoon, and there'd be a whole bunch of people in front of Needick's, and you'd stand there with a hot dog, and you'd be arguing politics, or whatever the day it was, and that, that's what you did. So, and can you tell me how, how you remember kind of the climate changing? Because you were saying how you yourself weren't particularly afraid because you've grown up in this open yeah. community, but, but many of the women and, and men that you knew were. Can you kind of recall how that changed and people got to be less fearful? And let's just wait till it's a little bit quieter. Now? We're good now. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I think the climate started to change, I would say, not so much in the 70s. I'm going to be questioned on this, but not so much. But when the AIDS crisis came about, we were front and forward. Uh, I, I think that opened a lot of eyes up. There was a lot of prejudice, more prejudice than there was. The 70s, I think, could be depicted as bars, uh, hangouts, the trucks on the west side where the guys probably got a lot of AIDS. I think that was the, the beginning. The bars, a lot of alcoholism came from there, a lot of drug addiction, but that was all we had. We didn't have centers, we had bars. They, the guys had the trucks on the west side. That's what we had. So the 70s were our learning period. We learned a lot in the 70s. We had newspapers. Uh, there were a lot of things, different organizations that fell through the wayside because they couldn't get the money to keep organizations open. Nobody was there to keep things open. So the 80s more or less came in and that was an eye opener. And the thing that opened our eyes more was the AIDS crisis. And I think that when the band played on, came about the boys in the band, different movies, then you started the women's movies coming out. Uh, 
the 80s came in, you had Desert Hearts, which is like a classic among the lesbian community, Abound, which is an incredible lesbian movie. That was, we had 92nd Street, Women's Books, which was there. But the 80s really opened up our eyes as well as the straight world. When the AIDS crisis came about, in the village there was fear, a lot of fear. Because who lived with who, who was sleeping with who. Uh, a lot of the funeral parlors didn't want to take the dead. Uh, I think Reddings was the only one, thank you, Jim, the only one that took um, the gay men. St. Vincent's was the only hospital that would take them. It was very hard because of the blood situation. We didn't know until a long time after how it actually was spread. Everybody thought, we knew about when uh, Arthur Ashe died, the tennis player, from a, a blood transfusion. We knew, they knew right then and there. They knew before that, but they didn't have the exact meaning, you know, the exact way of getting it. There are several ways of getting it, but that was one of the main things, blood. So right away, the rest of the hospitals and organizations, they sort of backed off. And some of the guys were left, you know how many guys lived alone and passed in their apartments? It was a sad time. And my best friend went to San Francisco to die. And that hurt. So during that particular time, then the gay issue came forward. And then you have what I call the slowpoke 90s. But there were a lot of changes coming forward. And SAGE was there, and the LGBT T Center was there. What a mess the LGBT Center was, but it was ours. And things were starting to come out of there, and things were starting to come out of SAGE. And, and by they, mess, you mean the building, right? The building, yeah. yes. It, it was yes. a complete mess. It was, yeah. it, you know, I mean, they did it two and three times. What you see is not one or two times. I think it's the third time that they fixed it over. Yeah. So I remember when the, 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 was it the last one or the one before, where they were giving out uh, plastic hats with a little pink symbol on it, and they were plastic um, hats that the construction people were wearing. And they would gave us that uh, at the opening, but then it closed again and opened again in another way, shape or form. So there were a lot of changes during that, that time. And as for the lesbian community, they more or less not went into hiding, but it was like sort of little amounts of, of lesbians going here and going on trips. And more or less when the bars started to close and started to go away, they more or less, they went away. And the CR group stopped, the newspaper went out, majority report, other women's newspapers like Red Stockings, Blues, whatever the thing was, they went out. So it was sort of, sort of a standstill during that particular time when the AIDS crisis came about. I think that was the full energy going on that to try to find out what was going on. So then, as I said, the 90s came in and there were a lot of changes during the 90s, but not, not a big change, not a very big change. We went along and built organizations where we could but there wasn't that much support at that time because everybody had the taste of the 80s. I can't say for the, the, the straight world, but for the, for the lesbian community, there was a lot of things that stopped. And they were more or less going on their own. Who were getting now good jobs because of the women's movement? People were getting homes. Something that the women didn't have, the gay men had. You look at Fire Island, and it was all men, maybe one or two women that had the money to buy that kind of property, but in the lesbian community, we didn't have it yet. And when the, 80, the late 80s, early 90s came, then women saw that they could get good jobs, good educations, there it was. So then they started to back off from organization, uh, doing things for the lesbian community. It was mainly in the LGBT center which had groups on Friday night 
the 40s group, the 50s group, the 60s group, you know, 40-year-olds, 50-year-olds. On a Friday night, we would have it in the center. And Sage, of course, was all over the place until they settled in the center itself. We had two little rooms. We had downstairs, and then upstairs was the office. And that was really the, the, the real beginning, the, the absolute beginning of what you see now in Sage. And we started to grow. And then all of a sudden, we find ourselves on 27th Street in this big place. And I'm saying to myself, my God. I remember when Pat, my partner, and a, a guy called Malcolm Smith, who's not with us anymore, we were in a little office. I don't even remember where it was, because we would shift around. And we were doing a mailing one night for Sage. And he said to me, my God, we got 150 members. I said, my God, we're getting so big. So you can imagine where we came from. How many members are there now? Thousands. Because we have satellite districts now. We're in all five, well, no, four boroughs. Queens has their own. And they're starting to talk about being around the world. So it, it is a huge organization with lots of money now and lots of opportunities. But a lot of the opportunities should be in the direction of the lesbian community. We are doing a lot for the gay men and the trans now. But you see, I'm going to go back to what I was saying. The lesbian community is not together. That's a big problem. So we can't really go forward in that. I sit with a few of them at night. And a few of them, what they're looking for is a girlfriend. A few of them are just looking for a place to hang out. out. A few of them just want to gather around the, around the table and talk about what trips they're going to go on. So it, it's a whole different meaning for the lesbian community that I see right now. And I don't know how we're going to get out of it or if we ever will get out of it. But as I said before, the transsexual is doing what we started to do. And I'm just hoping that they can hold on as long as they can. So let me ask you... Okay, we need to swap the data card. Oh. So one of the things I wanted to ask you yeah. is, because um, I personally think this is really interesting, kind of the change in vocabulary and the way that um, lesbians think and talk about themselves. Like, for instance, you more than once talked about the bull dykes. Yeah, well, they, see, the, the, the thing of uh, butch and femme is relatively gone. It's, it's gone. It, it's it's really gone. Now we have uh, uh, androgynous. So, but so, but tell me about that. Tell me about the before it was gone. Like, what did it mean to be butch or femme or a bull? Well, guy? the butch was the man, and the femme was the girl. And did a and they dressed. Uh, how could I say it? Uh, they emphasized. In other words, the girl was femme, but too femme. The butch was masculine, but too masculine. In other words, like cartoon figures in a way. That's the way I view it, is that they went beyond what a male should be. That's when I was talking about the club. What we wear is an illusion. And these people in the early days, the butch and femme society, which what my friend Pauline was ahead of, they emphasized the butch and femme look. And then the bull dykes and the... the, the, the um, Oh, what was that other word? Well, the, the, the daughters of Belitis. They were very strict. The lesbian really had to be a butch or a femme. And that's how it was in those days. But that was the 50s going into the 60s. And what was that about? What, what was the thinking there? What was going on? To tell you the truth, I think they were trying to, to be in society. Maybe they thought in a way that they were going to be uh, better off in society if they did the thing that they really thought they were. I can't think that way because I was a woman, still a woman, but I loved women. But I never made myself a butch or a femme. I, I, I have no a title or anything like that. It, the way I am, I am. So they took the emphasis on, on looking very masculine and the female, you know, 
you're going to do this for me tonight. You've got to make my dinner. You know, that, that's how they spoke. Sort of emulating the, the male. Stereotype. Man. Stereotype. So it was that type of thing. But then as the 70s went on with the feminist movement and the gay movement and the 80s came, and then the, it just dissolved. It just went. There, there was a, it was in the LGBT center for a long time, the Butch Femme Society, but that was it. So now when you think about um, the, uh, in 2016, President Obama declaring the Stonewall Inn and the park in front of it as a national monument, what, what did that mean for you when that happened? Well, first of all, they're trying to change the name of Sheridan Square with Sheridan Square Park. It, they called it something else now. It's still to me Sheridan Square Park. Recognizing the Stonewall, I, I think it's wonderful. But let's start talking about the people that were there and the people that passed being there and being r routed by the police and beaten up. There's one fella, no names, he's in Sage now, he was the head hairdresser for Henry Bendel. They beat the shit out of him one night in the 70s, early. He now has brain damage and everything. He, can't, he, he thinks all right, but this man was really on top. And two guys beat him up so bad that what, it's, it, so I've seen things. I've seen my friend Pat, not my Pat, another Pat, wind up in St. Clair's, which doesn't exist anymore, beaten up to a pulp. She stood this tall, a little woman. They beat, the sh they beat her up. I've seen beatings. I've seen people really get hurt. I, my family, my mom and dad, I can't say enough about them. If I brought a friend home and they were really a mess or something, they would take care of them. My grandma and grandpa were the same way. There was no difference. So I always was, and my aunts on my father's side, they were amazing, especially my Aunt Terry, the apple of my eye. She was tough, she was real, she was the vice president of Planned Parenthood. She really made it way before anybody else did in a long, long time ago. But she wasn't gonna be put down. My other influence, the influences in my life were my mom and dad, my Aunt Terry, my grandma on my, my mom's side, Bella, had a big influence on me. And the different women that I came across in my life that were powerful in their own way. I, I, I can't think right now there were so many. But I learned along the way. And the one thing Bella said to me, and I'll always remember, she said to me, Barbara, just treat everybody like they're naked. And I looked at her and I said, what? She said, this way you can say and do anything you want. And then I got the message. But it's amazing who influences you in your life. And just so that it's on the recording, we're talking about Bella Abzug. Right, right. The lady with the hat, as people say, the lady with the hat. Uh, she, was, she was a big influence. Yvonne Morrow was a big influence in my life. I hope she's still alive and well. Uh, I can I can think of a lot of women that never had a name, not for the press or anything, that were very did a lot in, in my life. And what was it that um, that you learned that that helped you? Be truthful. Say what you mean and mean what you say, as Popeye would say. Uh, don't be afraid. Even if I've had guns to my head, I've had rocks thrown at me, I've been cursed at, I was spit at last year, because I stand up in the sage bus every year. I get out of Stonewall, and I have all my little young protectors around me, and a guy came next to me with a sign, a very horrible sign about us in Trump's name. And I said, look, I'm 69 years old. You want to kill me here? Go ahead. I said, you're not going to prove anything to me. He walked away. So the young kids, they creep, Barbara, Bob, they do that every year for me anyway, when we have the march. 
because I will stand in front of that bus and I will wave to them and I will say everything is okay to the young people. Get going. You've got to carry on where we left off because I can't do it anymore. I wish I could. It's tough. I'm not well. I'm trying to do what I can and I do what I can but there's so much more. We've got to get that ERA passed, but not with Trump in there. Forget about it. But whoever we, got, whoever we get in next, let's hope we get somebody in next, that we can bring that up again because we're still second-class citizens. I know it's only on the law book, but it's an important thing to me. So my, my grandmother was a suffragette. She had her own business with my, with my grandfather. She was the business end of it. My, my grandfather was the cook. That was my family. The women were the strong points in my life. The men were pussycats. My dad, my dad could be rough, but he, he had a kind heart. He loved animals, he loved my mother, he loved me. He loved his friends. When my, my, my mom was sick, it shows you how guys are to each other, which women don't have, unfortunately. I wish they did. His friend Joe came in, a super. And he said, he took his bank book and he threw it on the table and he said, Vinny, take it, it's yours. My father looked at him and they hugged. That's a friend. Not because of the money, because of the heart. My father didn't take it. But that's how we were in my family with their friends and I learned. And I learned what a friend was. Most of my friends are gone. I may have one or two that I can really call a friend today. The rest, well, I take with a grain of salt. And I hate to say that, but it's the truth. The guys, John, I love you, you know that. And Jim, and the other guys that are around me, they mean a lot to me. Because when Pat was bad, they were there for me. Not one woman. Not one. And I will never forget that. And the guys have always been on my side, even when I was in school. My cousin, she couldn't get a boyfriend because she used to stay in the house all the time. My grandmother said, would you get her out of the house? I introduced her, hey, Jim, come on over here, date my cousin. Because the guys trust me because I thought like them. So it means a lot. The guys mean a lot. And what I lost in the 80s, I will never forget. So we're going to say goodbye in a minute. So I want to ask, is there anything else you want to tell me about kind of your path and and the, the evolution of your life and I never thought I would live to 69, 70 years old. That I never thought. It's like the farthest thing from your mind when you're 25, 30 years old. Uh, you don't mature really until I think you're in your late 40s. For me, that's the way I, I feel. Uh, that the organizations and your young people are starting to really move in your direction the way with these kind of things, where we did different things in our day. That I appreciate. Um, I hope that it comes to a point where we can get control, the women mostly, of our destiny. The men are already there. The women are getting there, but they're not there because they're not honest within themselves. And I'm going to keep saying that. Maybe it'll get through their heads that they have to start sticking to each other and stop battling. It's always a battle with them. It, it, it's a terrible thing. To this day, it's a battle. And that, that's the thing I want to finish off with is please, the women community, trans, lesbian, straight women, whatever, start to talk to each other like human beings. It's going to mean a lot for the future of women. That's it. Thank you. I think we'll stop there. Thank you, Barbara. You're welcome. And I did that from the heart. I could tell. Sounds like it's a complicated